Okay, well hello, my name is Colin and I would like to welcome you to episode 12 of Roll by Roll's Tavern Talk. A show where we, the Roll by Roll gang, discuss various aspects of running a great D&D campaign based on our experiences with D&D 5e and our current Adventures in Emethan homebrew campaign. So joining me tonight are the rest of the Roll by Roll gang. Uh, we have Barry, who plays Nightingale and Landis. Say hello, Barry. Hello, Barry. <laughs> Excellent Cheers. start. Uh, we have Egan, who plays Douglin and Lafferty. Say hello, Barry. Hello, Barry. <laughs> and last but certainly not least, we have Max, who plays Kogon. And Max, you have to say Kogon's last name for us. In an accent? Oh, absolutely. Oh, yeah. Drem na ma. Oh, love it. Love it. <laughs> <laughs> love big, it. Big draconic name. Yep. Big draconic name. Absolutely. So our D&D &D 5e homebrew campaign called Adventures in Emethan leans pretty heavily into, char uh, into the characters uh, and their stories as fuel to create sort of the greater story. And in order to run a campaign that way, you need characters that are built with story in mind. So for this episode, we are going to discuss our thoughts on how best to build a character this way. But I warned you guys that uh, before we get started, we're just going to quickly dig into the question of... What is your favorite character class and why? So I think I'm going to start with Max on this one. Max? All right. It pains me to admit it, but I love the simple fighter. They're just... Uh, I'll, I'll get teased by aspects of other classes every now and then, <laughs> but I love the fighter. I love the simplicity and the thought of being that character that doesn't have many bells and whistles, just a lot of hard work and training and getting up in there, fighting toe to toe to protect his, his or her allies. That's that's my jam. No, that's that's good. That's good. Yep. Mr. Egan, you. Well, I was completely caught by surprise <laughs> about this question. So um, yes. it, it just so happens I uh, uh, Bard, yes, 100%. Uh, Bard is my absolute favorite character, uh, especially the way they've done it in 5e with their versatility. I mean, they really can tap into just about every other class there is and be pretty decent at it. Um, and, you know, just for the record, I, I tend not to play a cliche style Bard that's trying to, you know, get with the dragon. Uh, so, uh, I just, I love that they're just a lot of fun to play, uh, the versatility and, and, uh, you know, uh, the opportunities that a bard gives you hundred percent bard. Barry, you, well, I, I had to think hard about this because, you know, pre-show we were talking about it and everybody had such good answers. But when I look back at my, my gaming pass, my general go-to class that I have a lot of fun with is the rogue and I love rogues because you know you're the sneaky character you're you know I, I generally love guys that can sneak around and you know create mischief and cause problems and you know steal the jewels and get out unscathed while everybody else picks up all the the mess behind them so I, I just love rogues for that reason yeah and for for myself, uh, again, you know, we were talking about this a little bit pre-show, and uh, for me, it was—it's always been ranger, and I think that mostly, probably, subconsciously, I have always looked at so many of the uh, of the characters we talked about, like Lord of the Rings. I can't think of some of the other ones you mentioned, Max. Right Dragon. at the top. Yeah, Can't. Drake. Exactly. Like, there's so many. The range are like Tannis from Dragonlance, and like you said, I think I've always just they they were always rangers to me, and that really just became the character that I really um, 
I really enjoyed playing, uh, which I haven't done in a while, so I might have to I'd have to jump into one of your campaigns as a ranger here. So, all right, so let's move into our topic of the night. Um, we are going to talk about building D&D characters with story in mind. So uh, maybe I'll, uh, just to jump around here a little bit, uh, maybe I'll, Egan, I will start with you. Uh, give us your thoughts thoughts you know maybe a little bit of your process your thinking process when mm -hmm. you're building characters because i mean we are a group that does this i would say almost naturally i mean max you know being the newest member of the gang here um you know that's i think one of the things that that was appealing for us is you had that same sort of you know, Kogon as fantastic story that we're weaving into the greater story. But Egan, what's what's your thoughts and process around when you're building your characters with story in mind? Yeah, I, I you know, I think there's going to be a, a trend with these tavern talks about this table about uh, really it's all about driving the story. Uh, when you create a background, uh, we, we try to create it to where it's open-ended, to where there's, you know, there's a, a, a base, a platform to start with, but there's a lot that can be picked up throughout throughout the game. Um, you know, Douglin, take Douglin, for example, he was kind of designed almost with a, a custom uh, oath, of, uh, you know, to be created for him because he didn't really fit the mold of a traditional paladin. And that was by design. He, you know, he was created to be, you know, sort of this, you know, tragic character that, you know, sort of needed to uh, be forced to, to do these things for the greater good. Um, but as far as, you know, creating characters with story in line, I, I, we've done it the other way. I, I'm sure we've all just built, you know, uh, min-max characters and just gone, you know, your, your stereotypical this with high this or whatnot. And when I found the way to do it, it just felt right. It just felt like I'm creating a story first. The stats will come later. And um, I found it much more pleasurable. And I do think that it, it creates a, a much more in-depth character that's more enjoyable to play. Yeah. Yeah. Barry, your thoughts? Well, I'm sure all, all of us have our own process when making the, the kind of characters we all enjoy. And for me, um, I like to kind of talk with the group about what they're, they're thinking about doing and find something that's complementary to the group that we're headed into. You know, I'm, I'm pretty flexible. I can play anything. And, you know, starting that way with kind of getting a feel of where the campaign's going and things like that really helps me pick a character, you know? Like if we have lots of adventure planned ahead, well, you know, maybe that's where the ranger class might come in handy or or if we're creating a group that, or a campaign where we're gonna be trying to kill, we're, we're gonna slaughter our way through the monster manual. Well, okay, well now I'll pick maybe more of a martial class because that's, that's kind of more fun for that style of campaign. But in steering away from the optimization route, which, you know, there are hundreds and hundreds of channels that you can go to and they'll tell you how to optimize everything. But in the end, the only thing that will be different with your character, if you optimize is the name, because everybody picks the exact same stuff when you optimize. So you end up with the exact same characters. So my approach is kind of think of a backstory and then how that backstory would shape that character. And as a, just a really quick example, let's say we, we started with the idea that he's a, a, a budding chef. You know, he's started off in the kitchen and the backstory was, you know, he was a, a boy, poor family or whatever, loved to cook, befriended a fighter, got out in the adventuring world. And now his mission, because we're in a campaign that's slaughtering its way through the monster <laughs> manual is he wants to cook all of the monsters that he kills. <laughs> Yeah, you know, it's, awesome. it's it's just thinking about the story and yeah. making those choices that create content for storytelling. Because that's what you're all here for, is to create a really interesting story together. And it's it's a lot easier to do when you've got flaws and quirks about your character that you can feed off of. Yeah. Max, your thoughts? 
Uh, yeah, I think um, it's. Uh, I've talked about this in our DMing guide videos as well. Is uh, have a sense of flexibility. So, um, you, my, I always come up with a vision of what I think would be really exciting to play, and you know, I'll start brainstorming all these different ideas, but I never set anything in stone or get my heart too attached to a certain aspect because you're playing with other people and you, and you have a, hopefully you have a great DM who's trying to create a, a nice fleshed out world for you. And if that's the case, you want your character to be able to fit in there seamlessly. So um, I guarantee you, you'll still be able to blend most of what you have in mind with that. You just need to like, reflavor little things or and oftentimes your dm will have an idea that'll just blow you out of the water with how cool that is and it'll supersede something that you had initially thought of um so yeah just if you if you are being if you can keep that open-mindedness it'll help you create a character that's ready to engage with the table readily and since we're talking about that story aspect of things you're going to be able to develop way more story not just backstory because those ideas will come a lot easier too once you kind of understand the niches that your character is gonna uh fit like the, the nuances with the world but also just going forward and watching that character grow so yeah um for my you know for myself as a as a dm and you've all touched on this a little bit um the the character's backstory is a very important tool for me when it comes to weaving a story out of the characters. And so yeah. one of the things that, you know, I like to do and and we've done it with the various characters, I get I get involved in in the backstory, but I get involved in the backstory and I, Barry, I'll, I'll use you as an example when you were coming up with Nightingale. So Barry, I don't think I don't think Barry and correct me if I'm wrong, I don't think you were even fully thinking class or race or anything when you initially came up with Night Nightingale's story. Uh, you might have had some ideas in your mind. But you threw that to me and then, you know, we talked a little bit okay, this could happen here and this could happen here and maybe this is who these people are and um, you know, what what I like to to try and encourage people to do um, is add in potential hooks, things that I can I can run with. So, Douglin, you know, Douglin, you had your the loss of your family obviously was a, a a big obvious one to work with. Lafferty had his experience in uh, the gnome laboratory. You know, um, Nightingale had his whole um, his whole thief background and his escape and being found by the uh, Penumbra College and and that created just you know all kinds of hook. Landis has. His unfortunate experience at Windrest and what's happened to his grandfather, something that the story is building around right now. You know, and now we just have uh, Kogon that's that's moving in and, you know, the strange vision quest that Kogon ended up on to initially find the party and his, you know, we haven't had a lot of chance to develop yet, but... And I don't want to give too much away, yeah. uh, you know, but obviously there's a lot that's that's there, a lot of stuff, Max, that you wrote into your backstory that just give me these big meaty hooks that I can pull into the story and then start, uh, you know, start really weaving it, weaving it all together. Um, so one of the things that uh, I think is in, important when you're building a a character or I guess another thing um, is to be willing to let the story change and evolve your character so you know maybe we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that maybe you can give some examples from your actual characters uh, that could show or, or just your thoughts around that uh, so Egan we'll throw it back to you there I, I actually think Let's uh, say multi-classing is a perfect example of 
how this translates, right? And I can give you a couple of examples. One's in the current game with Lafferty, right? Um, Artificer uh, levels one through four came to a crossroads. Uh, basically, he, he, he feels that he lacks the power to help his friends, to find answers, to defend, etc. And so with Colin's help, we created a custom, let's call it a custom class, uh, you know, subclass of, of sorcerer, you know, called the Void Sorcerer. And basically, you know, all of those powers and whatnot were all story related. They're all based on the world of Emethan. You know, we touched on void and displacement as, you know, sort of themes for their powers. Um, so that was one way in which, you know, uh, the, the, the development of the character came directly from the story. Uh, another campaign that we ran, and we were talking about this uh, before we went on air, is um, I played a barbarian. And uh, basically, one of the other characters was a dwarven fighter and the dwarven fighter became a father figure for this barbarian and you know later on i think it was 11th or 12th level uh, and i had no intention of multi-classing you know he was a simple barbarian etc but um this dwarven fighter became such an impact in his life that he wanted to learn how to be a fighter proper stance in this and so the story just created this perfect, you know, opportunity to multi-class. It wasn't for any of the fighter benefits, none. I, I could care less about it. He was a barbarian, but this character wanted to, you know, prove, you know, uh, he wanted to prove himself to his dwarven, adopted dwarven father. And it, it, it was pure 100% story driven and nothing else. And it was fantastic. Yep. Yeah. Barry? It's a tear to my eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, as an example, Nightingale, uh, his story, his backstory was, you know, he was born in a town in Easterly and it was, he was a very kind of street kitty with a mom that worked in the washer district. So he started off a rogue and there's a whole big story. And if you want to hear, read about it, you can go to the wiki page and read all about his backstory. But so that character started out a rogue and when we started the campaign he was still a rogue though he was kind of in training to be a bard so if you watch through our first couple sessions i think it was probably till session four or five or somewhere in there maybe uh he he never did anything bardish you know i think he performed his first song and it was like three or four sessions in and he only did it to a very small crowd because he wasn't quite a bard yet. He was still a rogue at that point. In his mind, he was still a rogue, you know, like that was always the skills he fell back on. But as the story has progressed and he's kind of adopted this new life that he lives and all of the things that it entails, he's slowly becoming more and more that bard class and less and less that rogue class. Sure, those skills are still useful and Nightingale will always be the one who's, you know, picking the locks and pockets of whenever needed but his main thing now is he's a penumbra bard and that's his his driving force is that that class change and it's it's like again it's another multi-class and i i kind of wanted to have a character with that kind of a, a transitional experience in their life so when i was creating the character i knew already i wanted to multi-class but as you know working with colin we we kind of worked on the idea, you know, he was like, well, why not create your own kind of bard class? And so we did that and that really helped shape it again with the, working with the DM and again, building something that is more story driven than, you know, what powers it entails or anything like that. So that that's kind of my experience in having a character change as the game progresses. Now, everybody should have kind of some type of arc for their character it really helps create a lot of story for yourself for your dm and I, I i can go into some type of arcs that you can do later on in in the chat here maybe but for me with nightingale it's definitely that that change or redemption kind of arc of a character you know he started off a scoundrel and you know a con artist and things like that and when he became a penumbra bard he was still very much like that he used all the aspects 
of the Penumbra Bard's disguise and stuff to scam and swindle and hide and stuff. But when he met Douglin, it was the first time that Nightingale, as a being and a, a person, was involved in the good guy story. Because Douglin is a paladin and he's, you know, just and wants to protect everybody. And here, here's this rogue who comes from the, the streets and, you know, would normally sell people out to save himself is now on the good guy's story. And the good guy's, you know, glad to have him around and stuff. So again, there's that, that whole switch in the way he had to uh, evolve in the game. So yeah, it's been fun. Yeah, and I mean that really leans into what we're talking about, where you're, where you evolve that character into the story, right, as part of the story. Yeah. So, Max, obviously, Kogon is new. You know, yeah. we haven't, um, we haven't had a lot of opportunity for Kogon's character to develop yet. But just give but us your general. It has started. Concept. It has yeah. started. Yes, um, we we saw we, it in the last yeah. episode. Yeah, I wanted to touch that. So, um, with how we introduced. Kogon to the group he's coming in you know very much into the throes of things with this you know we weaved this good story together to make it all um seem plausible and and um you know mesh well and stuff but um Kogon's initial thing was because he's he's had these visions and he wants to meet these people so it's it was important for him to make sure that they uh perceive him well and that he shows that he can be very useful, you know, and that he's he's going to be good to travel with, you know. So and he's he's a golden dragonborn. So he's a by nature just sort of a genuinely good person. But he does have his own quests along with the major quests that coincides with this with these parties. And there's different layers to his personal stuff. So recently the most recent that he was presented with something that was very uh personal for him and it would it it, it, would, it took me off guard because i wasn't expecting it and uh and so it was great because i just you know you, you allow yourself to just uh let things happen and you know when you have a good group you can trust each other to play into it you know and we kind of have a bit of a dream team here so um, but you should experiment with this at your table. You know, we've had discussions in the past about communicating with your group, but so you can refer to those videos, but, um, yeah, so it really created this sense of, uh, turmoil for Kogan and, uh, he's, he, uh, had a, a moment afterwards with, um, one of the other characters that, uh, started to touch on on the depth of how this adventure could affect him and and the nature of the fact that he might need to um be a little selfish himself once in a while and can't just always be like yeah whatever you guys want to do all the time is the right thing to do every time you know what i mean like he's yeah. he's he's realizing that he has to that a part of his growth is he needs to be uh to speak up for the things that are important to him as well so yeah, there was you, you. You had some really interesting uh, conflict that yeah, I don't that want to reveal Kogan too was, much. Was working through. It was. It was. Watching. Yeah, it was really good. Um, so we've touched on this a, a little bit already. Um, hopefully, I'm not putting you guys on the spot too much to pull this stuff out of your your noodles there. But th there is genuinely the only thought that most people get when they hear the word optimization is combat you mm. optimize a character for combat but D, D does give you a lot of tools a lot of game mechanics that you can use to optimize your character for story and we were kind of batting a few of these around now i'll i'll start off um you know we <clears throat> we have three of our five characters have all utilized a homebrew subclass that fed into the story that we are, are trying to put together. Um, you know, when that, that is an excellent tool um, that you can use to 
to find some aspect of your story that you want your character to grow into so you can create a subclass that really leans into the way so you know we ha you Barry you mentioned it already Nightingale um, is the College of Penumbra um, we have the um, Void Sorcerer with Lafferty and we have the Oath of the Protector with uh, with Douglin, you know, each that 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 are really created with the story in mind. It wasn't about combat optimization. It was about this. This fits thematically with the story we're writing very well. Um, you know, but there's other things out there. You know, guys, if you can pull up a few things, you know, we've got feet, spells, items. Your thoughts on it, uh, Egan? Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll look at kind of how some of the custom things were built, right? The model was there, you know, to be to be honest. I, I, I piggybacked off of, uh, you know, already created models as far as, you know, when certain powers were given, at what levels, etc. And so, you know, using that, so, you know, there was no fear of over or even underpowering, to be honest with you. But, you know, things weren't taken for their combat prowess they were taken to stick with the theme of what you know let's take Douglin that he was created for um you know i didn't take a lot of offensive spells this guy is there to he's a meat shield he's there to take away the heat from others and so you know instead of getting uh you know an offensive cantrip uh you know or, or something like that he goes with something that wards a, a combat, uh, a, a, you know, a, a comrade. Compelled duel, let me pull someone away from you. Um, so, you know, it's when we use the word optimization, right? And listen, we've all been there. We've all looked how best to build something. We've all been on those YouTubes and, and websites that let you, you know, maximize a, a character to do the most damage and all that stuff. But I look at optimization in a different way. And that is to optimize your investment in your character. And, and we do all of these things to create more of an attachment to our characters. We're not a video game type of game. We don't just pop in stats, maximize it and go kill shit. That's just not how we do it. And and so if you know the theme that you're gonna see with these tavern talks, this group constantly goes back to how can I care more about this character? How can I connect more? And then how can this character connect with the other players at my table and create a really cool you know, storyline based on that. So for me, optimization means maybe something different than the traditional D and D player. Um, but I would venture to say that the, the folks on this uh, uh, show right now would 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 agree with me. Yeah, I just I want I just want to you know bring attention to one thing, you know, in terms of optimizing for story that you've done with with Douglin, right? I mean, Douglin's an older character than a lot of people may initially think about running. You know, he yeah. he's a... And you always play into the fact that he easily gets winded, you know, if there's a if there's a bit of a combat or a climb up a set of stairs and his knees are always popping and his back hurts. And, you know, that... Adds Never fan, makes a stealth check. Yeah, that, that, <laughs> that, 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 that is fantastic flavor towards story that does nothing in terms of combat right that is about just making uh, an interesting story character so barry your thoughts any yeah, anything I, in particular that you think is a fantastic tool there well a fantastic tool that i think you know D 5e needs to give credit for are the feats feats are a really unique way to give your character really cool abilities now if we again in this mindset of storytelling uh as an as a personal example when i first started the character nightingale um he's a, a custom race so he started with a feat and i picked magic initiate and you know of course everybody like oh well you know that's that's a great feat you know it's going to give you all these spells but the reason i took it is nightingale is actually a very religious person and he believed that the gods gave him magic. And so I picked Guidance, 
uh, spare the dying and bless. And I wrote this into his backstory that, you know, like when he was running the streets, everyone who was in his gang seemed to do a little better and no one ever died. And, you know, when, when it was time to make the right, you know, something just had to get done. If, if Nightingale was there, he somehow managed to uplift you to do it. And that was him using guidance and all this kind of stuff. So I, I wrote that into the story and it was like, why would you pick magic initiate if you're playing a rogue? It doesn't really seem to, to mesh very well. So, you know, in, in that kind of line of thinking, like there are so many really interesting feats. And I mentioned one before, like the chef, you know, you pick a fighter class and you're a chef because you love to kill and eat all the stuff. But like, imagine a wizard with the tavern brawler feet, <laughs> you know, as a young guy, you were always getting picked on. So you, you got in a lot of fights. So now you have to feet tavern brawler and, you know, it, it doesn't, really give you any great advantage in melee combat it's just really interesting when you're in the tavern and you know everybody thinks the fighter will be the first one to jump up in a brawl and here's the wizard hiking up the old robes and <laughs> grabbing a mug and smashing it on the guy's head right like look at all the feats like linguist most people would never pick linguist as a feat but it gives you three languages and the ability to write a cipher so now imagine you apply that to bard and you write all your songs in an interesting cipher so that no one can steal it and you create this bard who's really paranoid you know like the feats when you when you look at the feat beyond an optimization and like what can this do to drive character there's an endless supply yeah. of stuff you know the yeah. the whole fey touch the shadow touched write that into your backstory and that level four when you get your first feat all of a sudden that that history of you being raised by mystical beings in the woods yeah come manifest itself as you come out as fey touch so yep. that's you know a really interesting mechanic that's built into the game there's a lot of variety there look look past the great weapon master and the all of the feats that you normally pick to get the best damage and start thinking about the ones you could add to a character that normally wouldn't be there and see how you can mold that into an aspect of your character that will make them more than just the cookie cutter yeah, absolutely. Max. Okay, well, I think I just want to have a quick preface to this and say that if you're brand new and you're going to the table for your first time, it is okay to play with some of the stereotype cookie cutter power stuff because it is fun. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So, you know, don't feel don't feel bad if that's where you're leaning towards, you know what I mean? But take Barry's point to heart and really feel, really think about how you can organically mesh that into your overall character story. Cause it'll, it'll, it'll make it more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Immersive. If you do it that way, rather than gamey, like video gamey, you know, like, like Egan touched upon. Um, so that being said, if you're if you're especially now if you're more of a veteran player and you feel like you've done it all and you're maybe starting to wonder like what's keeping me in this game and things like that just start throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks and play with random generators um, just do wackadoo things you could have a character that's completely ineffective at combat but is just the most fun to play at the table and excels in creative ways outside of combat that really benefit the party. You know what I mean? The yeah. party will always be strong enough. Yep. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're yep. one character and you'll still, you'll still get hits in. You know what I mean? You'll still be contributing, but you might find too that you'll have spells that all of a sudden are like, you're thinking of ways of using them that you, no one's ever thought of before. In a combat situation, you know what I mean? And I get your DM, if they're experienced, I mean, this might not be the best situation for all DM, but for sure experienced ones will just love having this like this uh, outside the box approach to everything. And I think it could be a ton of fun. I'm, I've got a backup character in mind, but I'm almost throwing it out the window. <laughs> you know what I mean? I kind of want to go this route a little bit and just embrace some of the, uh, the chaos. And then when you do that, you know, improvise and manipulate to see how this can kind of be more cohesive as a make sense character, you know, kind of starting from the, from the spine, 
and, and building outwards rather than seeing how the world influenced what made this character. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So it'd be a fun exercise for us to do like a one shot where we make the worst character we oh. could possibly come yeah. up with. Yeah, yeah. they are yeah. just the worst band of ragtag yeah. yeah. misfits yeah. who Yeah. I I think the easiest way would be like you you build an optimal stat block and skill set for the wrong class that you're playing. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're yeah, playing the opposite pick class. Pick completely of the that. wrong class yeah. for that yeah. build. Yeah. I think yeah. that'd be a good place to start, you know? Yeah. Yeah. The burly half orc wizard. <laughs> yeah. Just all sorts of stuff. Low intelligent wizard, right? Just yeah. all sorts of stuff. I think you could have tons of fun with that. Um, yeah. Something to discuss with your table. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, you know, for me, I think there there are um, there are lots of fantastic spells that are yeah. not combat uh, related. That very um, one one spell that you have used um, quite often is prestidigitation, and I you know I've I've really enjoyed the creative ways that uh that you've found to use that spell and you know beyond the fact that i think a lot of people look at it in the book and and think i can't say that so i'm my character is not going to uh, <laughs> to uh, to get prestidigitation <laughs> but uh, you know it's a really it has a very uh wide scope of little little quirky things that you can do with it to add flavor to your game you know um and I mean, you use it in a very utility way, you know, putting out a a, 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 a small section of fire because it allows you to put out a campfire, right? And it's, uh, you know, and there's lots of spells like that in there that yeah. that you could use to in really unique ways, or even just using some of what we'll call the more uh, martial spells in a creative way. You know, like there's that you think, you know, to, to sort of what you're saying, think outside the box a little bit. You know, maybe this person has spells. Maybe this guy's a terrible wizard and he has these spells and he uses them in completely the wrong way all the time, you know, and not not in not in the expected sort of combat fashion. Um, but we <laughs> we are like uh, at Fizz a point. Man. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like Fizzban. Um so I, I think we we better wrap it up here. I'll get everybody sort of last thoughts on uh, building your D and D character with story in mind. Egan, final thoughts. Uh, yeah, just to kind of reiterate, the whole reason that we we've embraced this and we love it so much is that we do feel like it creates a bigger connection, um, you know, to the story, to the character. Uh, and to the others at the table, uh, it, it 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 makes a character real. Like this is this is real and not just stats. So give it a shot. Yeah. It could be fun. Yeah, absolutely. Barry, uh, if I could impart kind of a, a notion for people to think about when you're when you're making a character, think about the favorite characters you have in your fictions and the books you read. They all generally aren't perfect characters. They've got flaws, they've got faults, shortcomings, things like that. And you relate to those things more than you do. Like no one can relate to Superman in his powers because he's Superman. What you relate to him is his struggle with those superpowers. Everybody's got a struggle, right? So when you're building a character, try to make something about them that is relatable in an aspect a flaw a shortcoming or something and you will have more fun and be able to immerse yourself more in that character than you would you know the ultimate fighter who you can never see yourself being but you just wanted to play you know like think about trying to make it a little more realistic a little more something that you can relate to and you'll have a lot more fun yeah yeah absolutely max uh yeah your depth of character slash story slash backstory should coincide with the depth that that is used at your table all right so you can still have tons of fun with this at a table that is not nearly as deeply story driven and it's more of the you know chips and dip style uh D, &D weekend D, D game um you just come up with your list of little quirks and motivations and throw those in there and you don't 
necessarily need as much backstory right so you know this is yeah. i think most people who are established ha have this understanding but if you're brand new you know it's all again it's always communication that's always the biggest thing so just find out what that table what their style is and um fit that and you'll just you'll have a more enjoyable time rather than trying to <laughs> give your five page back sort of the DM like we don't play that kind of game right you know so <laughs> I've been on those yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so like what um, the heck uh, dude just roll your dice yeah. let's go so just just manage your expectations and manage your scope to fit the table that you're at I think that's just the biggest good advice yeah yeah uh for me you know and and pulling a little bit from what you said Max um Always, always work with your DM to see whatever crazy idea you come up for your, your character, if, if there's a way to have that come to life. You know, um, we did it through some subclasses, you know, we've done it through some magic items, some spells, you know, Barry brought some spells in, things like that. Um, you're not going to know what's possible in your table's game until you just sit down with your DM and say, okay, I got this really crazy idea for a character. How how could we make this work? You know, And chances are your DM's going to go, this is great. This is awesome. Let's let's figure out how we can do this. You know, I mean, if if you've got the, uh, you know, we, we've talked about Cook a couple of times who swings a mean frying pan, but you want to find a way to, to get a little extra damage into that frying pan, you know, maybe that is a magic frying pan somehow. And, you know, and and you can just, all of a sudden, every every person, every monster she clocks with that frying pan goes down, right? And that could make for, uh, for some fun. So, uh, well, we better put a wrap on episode 12. Uh, of our roll by roll tavern talk so we hope that uh, everyone's enjoyed tonight's topic uh, tavern talks are live streamed now on tuesdays after each of our saturday night in adventures in emethan sessions um, our next session is scheduled for january 21st um, so the recording will be available on youtube on Thursday. Uh, for those of you that are watching on YouTube, please support us by hitting that like button and subscribing to our channel. Uh, if you hit the little bell icon, you'll be alerted whenever our next session occurs. So, guys, to uh, end the episode, we will offer a little cheers to everyone. Thanks for joining us in the tavern. And uh, we hope that you can join us next time. Thanks very much. Thanks, guys. Cheers. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for watching.